Scientists have made a breakthrough discovery, a revolutionary treatment that makes you live longer. It gives you superior memory and makes you more creative. It makes you look more attractive. It keeps you fit and have less food cravings. It saves you from diseases like cancer, dementia. It fights off the common cold and the flu. And guess what? There's no side effects. It'll make you happier, less anxious, and improve the quality of your life. Are you interested? Well, this revolutionary treatment has been known for thousands and thousands of years, and you do it every night, and that is sleep. Now, this isn't supposed to be some overdramatic intro, but everything I've just mentioned have been the proven benefits of sleep among many, many others. Now, the only problem today is that sleep is not as prioritized in our world in terms of like what we're educated about, what we're told about, because in, instead of telling us about the importance of sleep, we're told about the importance of productivity. And this is true across all boards and all parts of life. Whether you're a student like I am, I know most students can relate to what I'm saying because um, I go to boarding school where pretty much every minute of the day is scheduled for you. You have classes during the day, sports right after school, and then you have a study hall block from 8.30 to 10 after dinner. Now we're given about an hour and a half of time in the day to work, which the whole school knows that no one's getting their work done in that much time. They're up pretty late at night and most students on average sleep between 12 and one. Most sleep beyond two or three and guess what? School starts at eight in the morning. So it's obvious that no one is getting enough sleep. Even those not at a boarding school can relate, even those not going to school can relate because employees are in a similar boat, even adolescents are in a similar boat and children are in a similar boat. For employees, like they, they go to work and even though they have like a nine to five structure for their work, they'll often be up late at night. It's like the person who's up on his email till like two in the morning and then is in office at five in the morning is like glorified. Like that's the ideal life we're trying to live to. Now, the, the problem is that we have two ways to really assess sleep. And that is one quality and two quantity. And the problem is that most people are getting neither. So let me give you a quick intro to this guide. So in the next hour to two, I'm going to be providing you all the education you need about one, why do we sleep and what is sleep? Number two, the health and productivity implications of sleep. So basically how improving aspects of your sleep can help you improve um, aspects of your health and productivity to a huge degree. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of tools that you can use to improve your sleep. And then if you're interested in learning more, I'll give you further resources. Um, whether you're a student like me, an employee like my parents, or anyone interested in finding ways to improve your sleep, I guarantee that you'll find value in this video. So there are many ways to watch this full guide. You can skip around um, and see that how each of the segments are timestamped, or you can watch in full order. I would recommend, especially if you're new and you've never like read about or learned about sleep before, just watching the video from the start to the end, because understanding like the science about why we sleep, what sleep is, leading into like the tools, it's kind of intertwined together. So I, I guarantee if you watch this from the start to the end, you'll find so much more value in this video. But the way the reason it's timestamped and the reason why the different segments is so that if you're coming back and you want to like check out a specific segment or you're really only interested in learning about one specific thing, it's designed for you so that you can skip around and watch those segments because each segment is designed so that you can watch it start to end, um, even though there's some value in watching it from the beginning to the end of the video. Um, it is quite a long video, so it's up to you if you want to sit down and watch it in one sitting or break it up. I'm totally fine if you want to like break it up in like different segments and watch it throughout, take time to implement the things you learn. But again, that's up to you and how you best want to take this guide. I do think that the things that I provide in this video will change your life because some of these things have indeed changed my life to a huge degree. Um, I really started learning more about sleep in March of 2023 and today it's July 22nd, 2023. So in the last four months, I've spent so much time reading about sleep, learning about sleep and trying different things to see what works. And now I'm going to try and teach you as much as what has worked for me so that you can to improve your life in so many ways. Because to be honest, sleep is the foundation of life. And if you're not getting good sleep, it's hard to really do much else. All right. Um, one more thing is that in the modern world, as I've mentioned already, that sleep is very deprioritized, but also just health in general. As the years are going by, there's more and more health problems, there's more and more um, things like sleep that are being less prioritized. And I want to say that if this video changes your life and helps you to improve your sleep to a huge degree, please share it with other people. 
because then you can help them save their life as well. And together we can make this movement of helping everyone to improve their health. So section one is what is sleep and what are the benefits of sleep? So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is that it's less about the period of time that you're sleeping, but it's also um, if you're trying to learn about sleep and why we sleep and how to improve your sleep, you also have to understand that a lot of sleep and wakefulness periods are tethered together, which basically means what you do during the day affects how well you're going to sleep and how well you slept affects what you're going to do during the day. So you can either make like a positive cycle where you're doing good things in the day that will improve your sleep, which there go back and help you improve the quality of your life as well. But it can also be the other way around where you're staying up pretty late at night. Um, you're not doing the correct protocols in terms of what you're doing in the day to improve your sleep. That can lead to a negative cycle where it just gets worse and worse and worse. And I've been in both boats. Now, there are so many effects, um, positive effects of getting good sleep. And this includes the ability to be focused in the day, like just being able to like focus on whatever work you're trying to complete, um, the ability to be alert, and really to a huge degree, emotional stability. Meaning that if you're sleeping well, then you're going to just be able to control your emotions better, which is huge for many people because it can also help you in like addiction management and helping you to overcome addictions. Sleep is huge. Now, for a long time, we haven't really understood sleep fully and people don't really see the value in sleep. They kind of just think of it as this thing that we do every night. We just close our eyes and then we wake up the next day, something that's kind of in our cycle. But people are not really educated about like really the crux of like why sleep is important for us. So people kind of just look the other way and say, yeah, I'll just sleep tonight. But there's so much more to it. And as I said before, we when we think about like people we look up to, we often look at the person who's flying from time zone to time zone on his email till one in the morning and in office at five in the morning. That's glorified because we see this person as like a busy man who is always working hard and making money. But at the end of the day, they're at the same time it's ruining their health in the long run. And we can't really blame these people for the way they are because it's not really their fault. They just lack the education they need to understand the importance of sleep and how it will actually make more progress to their main goals in life if they were to improve that. But luckily, you're here today to get some of that education. So when we're thinking about like how important sleep is, I value sleep as high as food and exercise. What I mean by that is like I consider one night of poor sleep quality. So like let's say last night I slept pretty bad, like I had low sleep quality. I would say that's as bad as like I didn't eat food the entire day or I missed exercise for a week. I think that's how important I'd say this, the importance of a good night's quality sleep is. And some more hidden benefits of sleep that you might have not known before is number one, retention of knowledge. So when you're trying to understand how our memory works, we have like this long-term kind of memory storage in the back of our brain. I have a hippocampus, which is like a short-term memory storage. So when you're going about your day and you're like learning new facts and information or your, your brain is like collecting this information, most of that information is stored in your hippocampus. And then when you're sleeping, that information gets transferred from your hippocampus to like your larger memory storage drive. So for that process to be successful, for you to remember as much as you can during the day of what's important, it's essentially you get that sleep so that the memories can successfully be transitioned from your hippocampus to your larger memory storage. And if you think about like applications of this, like for example, for students who are studying for a big test, if they were to like do all the studying, like let's say they, they did some memorization for their test and it took about two, three hours for that. If they got a good night's sleep of that, their ability to retain that knowledge and the memory is so much higher than if they were crammed the night before. Because we think that cramming the night before is kind of like new norm for how we approach our schoolwork. But the problem is that while you may be like getting all the content in by cramming the night before, you're not going to have a good retention of what you just learned because you're getting that low quality sleep. Meaning you're, in addition to that, you're probably going to perform bad on your test because you're just not awake and focused. So really, there's just so many, so many negative effects about not getting good sleep, especially if you're trying to perform well on like some assessment. But for the retention of knowledge, for good memory, sleep is essential. And we talked about as well, better control of your emotions and then having, um, helping you with your cravings and preventing relapse and addiction is huge. So before we can really get into like how sleep really works and like what are ways we can improve the sleep, there's some foundational things that we have to establish so that you understand why do we feel tired in the first place and what makes us actually transition into sleep. And the first thing that we're going to discuss is our circadian rhythm. So through evolution, we have a 24 hour internal body clock 
that dictates how we feel during the day, right? So we call this the circadian rhythm. And the reason it's 24 hours is just because of evolution. Like our bodies have adjusted to like the rising and the falling of the sun. So our, all our body processes have kind of adjusted around that 24 hour cycle. That's why we feel hungry at about the same times each day and not just like random times like throughout the week because our, our body functions on a 24 hour cycle, which kind of makes sense, right? So the release of a lot of different hormones, like the hormones that make us feel hungry and the hormones that make us feel tired and awake are released on the 24 hour cycle. So essentially that's why at about eight to 10 PM, you're gonna start feeling tired and about in the morning, you're gonna feel awake because we have this 24 hour cycle in our body that's dictating, okay, should we feel awake right now or should we feel asleep? Now, the thing that the circadian rhythm likes, that's I really wanna emphasize is consistency. Meaning that if you are sleeping at the same time and waking up at the same time every day, if you're eating at the same time every day, your circadian rhythm gets stronger. What that basically means is that it's more adjusted to the routine you've established for it and it's able to better like release those hormones and to better tell you like, yes, you're awake right now, you're tired right now, if it's very consistent. You can imagine that if one day, like tonight I slept at 8 p.m. and the next day I slept at midnight, it, the circadian rhythm will get confused because it's trying to, it's kind of telling you at what time you're starting to feel tired and you're kind of going against that by sleeping at this time or that time. So it's essential that circadian rhythm likes consistency and we can actually use that as our first tool over here for how we can use our circadian rhythm to improve our sleep. So what I want to ask you is to take a second to like ask yourself this question. What is the time that you can wake up and sleep every day for the rest of your life? I encourage you to pause the video and think about that because um, most people kind of wake up at different times each day because um, it's a weekend day, I'll sleep in today. Or it's a weekday, I gotta wake up early. I want you to sit back and think like, okay, the obligations you have, the work you have to do, and like your kind of day-to-day -day schedule, what is the time that you can wake up and sleep every day for the rest of your life? Back in March, 2023, I asked myself this question as well. And I decided, okay, well, I have school in the morning and then I have like my study hall and I have work to do in the evening. So I thought myself, I could probably commit to 6.45 a.m. every day as a wake-up time. I think that gives me enough time in the morning to kind of go about eating my breakfast, getting ready for my day. And then I also have this um, sleep time, I said it's 10.30 p.m. I wanted to say 10 p.m., but I felt that it'd be difficult to commit to that because sometimes I'll have a little bit more homework and things like that. So I told myself in March, I think that every day for the rest of my life, I can commit to waking up at 6.45 and sleeping at 10.30, and that should be no problem. And since then, I've pretty much been very consistent with that. And I've been able to like do that very well every single day. I, I have missed like a few days here and there, like maybe two or three times when I've had to like stay up for a certain purpose. Like that's okay if it's like a rare instance where you're staying up. But if it's like every weekend you're staying up at night and you're sleeping in late, that's going to really ruin your circadian rhythm. And that's going to affect like all the, the benefits that sleep is supposed to really be giving you. So again, take a few times to think about it. Um, you don't have to go fully extreme like I'm gonna wake up at 5 a.m. every day because then again that gets difficult You really like obviously we don't know where our life is going like what our situation in the future are going to be holding for us But I like to just tell my mindset like every day for the rest of my life Even if I'm only looking like a year or two ahead because it's good to kind of commit to that consistency and try not to miss any days if possible um, If you even if, if you miss like one or two days here and there that's fine but really getting sleep um, sleeping at the same time waking up at the same time, if that's the only thing you take from this video, that is gonna help you a lot because in that way, you're able to align the circadian rhythm with a consistency and that will really help you to improve your sleep. So consider your obligations and habits because that's gonna also affect um, the times you select. So I wanna take a second to talk about recovery sleep, right? So the mindset that a lot of people have that I don't really understand is that, okay, I'm gonna sleep a little later on weekdays, so. I have work, so I end up sleeping at 12 and I have to wake up at six for my job. So I'm getting six hours of sleep at night. Um, but then on the weekend, I'll get another few hours of sleep. I'll, I'll sleep in a little bit, get two or three extra hours of sleep. So it kind of like averages out and then I, I get enough sleep that I need to. That mindset is incorrect because by doing recovery sleep, you're actually killing your whole circadian rhythm and messing up your whole body's ability to stay consistent in that routine. Um, sleep is not like a credit system where like, you can get five hours today, eight hours tomorrow and average it out to like whatever's in the middle of that, like, like 6.5 hours of sleep. That's not how sleep works. Even if you're getting five hours of sleep on weekdays, you can keep that routine going even through the weekend instead of sleeping in. Because 
by sleeping in on let's say saturday you sleep in by an extra three hours your your body is going to not be able to adjust to that immediately and it'll take a few days to adjust to that meaning that it's definitely going to affect your productivity on saturday and sunday but it could potentially bleed into monday tuesday and even wednesday especially if you're like switching back to your monday routine and your body's trying to switch back and forth and it takes days for it to actually adjust to this routine so recovery sleep is actually killing you and i really recommend just sleeping at the same time waking up at the same time every single day for the rest of your life it will immensely help you um like if you're sleeping on the five hour routine on the weekdays your body's circadian rhythm has been accustomed to this when you change that routine and it's get adjusted and it'll just keep killing your productivity mood wakefulness and it'll really just impact all these aspects of your life so the mindset that i want to give you that i have right now is that consistency is better than quantity right so i know in the beginning we discussed there's two different ways we can assess our sleep in quantity and quality and when we're looking at okay how good am i sleeping we often look at the quantity like how many hours of sleep i'm getting so we correlate more hours of sleep with better quality sleep right but you have to understand that they're very different right obviously i'm not saying shorten your hours of sleep because getting a quantity sleep is good for you i'm getting like eight eight and a half hours of sleep at night maybe even nine sometimes so that is really what you want to aim for obviously high qual quantity sleep but you have to understand that just for getting a little bit more sleep on the weekends doesn't mean that you, we can keep switching our routine because um, consistency is greater than quantity, right? Because consistency really impacts the quality of sleep we're getting, which is something that we have to take into account in addition to quantity, right? So the way I like to think about it is when you define like, okay, this is realistic for me to sleep and wake up every single day for the rest of my life. And let's say with your work and stuff, it ended up being 12 to 5, Okay. So let's say you decided that I can very easily commit to sleeping at 12 and, five, and waking up at 5 every day for the rest of my life. Of course, it's not ideal getting 5 hours of sleep, but don't think to yourself that, okay, I'll get 5 hours of sleep on the weekdays and then 10 hours of sleep on the weekend and it all works out because that's not how it works. I'd encourage you to commit to that 5-hour routine, but then keep in your mind that I need to keep improving other aspects of my life so I can keep expanding that, right? So let's say today you start at the 5-hour routine, but then you're like, okay, I got to work on that and the weeks from now, weeks from now, maybe get up to 6 or you get up to 7. That's really how you want to be improving the quantity of your sleep, not saying that I'm going to get three hours of sleep today and then eight hours tomorrow and it all works out. So don't sleep in on the weekends. Make sure that you have the mindset of consistency is greater than quantity because recovery sleep is killing you. Um, one more like quick note I want to discuss is less about the sleep and more about wakefulness. And again, they are tethered together. Um, people often question are they night owls or are they morning larks right so do they are they like super productive in the morning or are they productive late at night and most people will immediately think of this question and think okay i'm a night owl because they, they think of all the times they're cramming for work at night and then how they feel like shit in the morning so immediately when you feel that way we're like okay i'm quite tired at night i'm sorry i'm quite awake at night and i'm quite tired in the morning immediately they will think that okay that must mean i'm a night owl but I say that's not entirely true because a lot of the reasons why most people feel super awake at night and super tired in the morning is just because they've gotten adjusted to that routine, right? If you're routinely pushing yourself to stay awake past the point that you normally feel awake, and then on top of that, you're getting really bad quality sleep, of course, you're not going to feel quite awake in the morning. And then, of course, you're going to all the energy is going to feed into the nighttime. That doesn't mean you're necessarily a night owl. But I'm not trying to say that there are completely no night owls because there are some people that are naturally night owls, but it's much lower than you think because from saying this, I'm assuming like 60 to 80% of people would claim they're night owls. Even I would have said that if I were watching this a few years ago. But in reality, only about five to 10% of people are actually naturally night owls. So it is quite rare, like one in 20 people at the most. Um, so it's not like everyone just happens to be a night owl. They've just gotten adjusted to that routine. But I encourage you, if you try to adjust your routine so that you're waking up earlier and you're sleeping earlier, I encourage you to see like over a period of time, like after a few weeks, are you really more productive in the morning, right? Because when I first started committing to this like morning wake up routine like earlier, at first I'm like, yeah, I kind of feel like shit in the morning. But once when I got adjusted to that routine, I realized, wait, I feel so much better in the morning now than I did before. In fact, I feel like I'm better now in the mornings than at night by a huge degree. So it won't be true for everyone. Some people might just realize that I 
just feel like shit in the morning when they try this out for months. That's fine. But for most people, I think it's the case that you're just accustomed to that routine and you should try waking up early in the morning. Okay. One more thing I want to quickly mention about the, some of the foundations of sleep is that what is allowed sleep time and actual sleep time. So we have to say, keep in mind that they're very different things, right? So we hear doctors say that you need to sleep seven to eight hours a night. So we think, okay, I'm gonna sleep at like 12, I wake up at seven, I'm getting my seven hours of sleep. But you have to understand that you have to take into account, is this allowed sleep time or actual sleep time? Because the mindset is that they're the same thing. Indeed, they're not. So for definition purposes, I would say allowed sleep time is a measure of time from the moment you went to bed to the moment you get out of bed. But for most people, because of poor quality sleep, they're not actually asleep the entire time they're laying in bed. So for example, if you're in bed for eight hours, you're probably getting like six and a half to seven hours of actual time you're asleep, just because it takes you time to go to sleep, takes you time to wake up in the morning. And then in between that, there's like periods of time when you wake up, you end up only getting like six and a half hours of sleep per eight hours of allowed sleep time. So if you're getting like 6.5 hours of sleep, thinking like, okay, that's good enough. You're probably only getting like five to five and a half hours of sleep. And then on top of that, for a lot of people, it's even worse than that because of the poor sleep quality. So it gets even worse. So that's not good. So I encourage you to think to yourself that just have this as a mindset in the back of your head, not really a tool, but just know in your head that like, just because I'm allowing myself to get nine hours of sleep doesn't mean I'm actually getting that nine hours of sleep. Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay. Section two is about light. And I believe this is probably the biggest and most important part of the video. Um, cause it goes back to the idea of the circadian rhythm, basically the thing that allows us to feel awake and tired at different times of the day. So one thing we want to know is that we've leveraged the circadian rhythm to determine that we're going to stay consistent with a sleep time and a wake up time every single day. But now we also want to, um, leverage the circadian rhythm as we discuss light. Light is one of the most essential things that we're going to talk about in the video about improving the quality of your sleep, right? So I want to first ask you a question. Why do we have eyes? So the answer to that's quite obvious to see, to see things around us, but actually that might not be the case. Through evolution, the first usage of our eyes was actually to just get sunlight into our eternal system. So for a long time through our evolution, we weren't able to actually see with our eyes. It was just like a hole in our body that allowed sunlight to get into our body. And then later through evolution came the came vision and they'd be able to see. And the reason that our eyes are so essential in getting light is because they're actually the only hole in our body, in our skull, that is connected to our nervous system. So basically any light that's coming in through our eyes gets communicated to our nervous system and there's no way for anything inside of our body to, uh, to take in that light um, inside of us. So we have a internal body clock as I discussed and it's called a super, super chasmatic chas nucleus, which sits in our brain. And this nucleus is connected to every neuron and or organ in our body. So when this clock tells us it's time to be awake, the entire body is in motion. Every neuron, every organ is saying, okay, let's move, let's move, let's move. But when that clock tells you, okay, it's time to be asleep, every part of the body is like going into that transitioning stage where it's getting tired and it's out of motion. The only way our suprachiasmatic nucleus knows what time of day it is, is based on sunlight, right? So again, we talked about how our body adjusted to the natural rising and falling of the sun. One of the reasons why our, we evolved this way is because there's, there's so much that our body can learn based on the position of the sun in the sky as to what time of day it is and to whether we should be feeling asleep or tired. And one of the reasons why it's so true to this degree is because when the sun is in the sky, at different solar angles, it produces different amounts of sunlight and there's different contrasts in the sky of like blues and yellows, right? So when your body sees the sun is rising, it is able to detect just by the contrast of yellows and blues in the sky, whether it is morning time or evening time. And the same is true for when it's afternoon time. It can tell just based on the amount of sunlight we're getting in, whether it is morning or evening. So, which is why it makes sense that when the sun rises in the morning, our body finds out, okay, it's morning time. It is time for me to feel awake. So it gets communicated to every part of our body that, okay, it's time to be in motion. It's time to go get some work done. And then as the sun is starting to come down, 
but we, from the sun that we're getting in our eyes, we're able to tell, okay, it's evening time, it's time to go down, and it's time to go get more tired. So this, as we said, the sunlight gets communicated to the nucleus and tells the entire body to be awake or sleepy. So for us to be able to feel really, really awake in the morning, and for us to feel like it's starting to get tired in the evening, we, our body needs cues and inputs for whatever it's about to do. So if we get light communicated through our eyes to our body, our body says, okay, it's time to be awake. So it is essential that if you're waking up in the morning and you want to feel awake, the first thing you have to do is get sunlight in your eyes, right? So if you go outside and you stand out there for like five minutes on a sunny day, you'll be able to get enough sunlight in your body to tell your body that, okay, it's time to be awake. You'll feel more energized and more ready to work. But not only that, you will set up a timer in your body that's saying for about a certain period of time. And then when the timer starts to build up throughout the day, by the time it's nighttime, you'll know that, okay, it's been about this much time since I woke up in the morning. So it's time that I start feeling tired again. So not only does it improve your wakefulness, but it also improves your sleep quality for the following night. So there are many different types of light that we use in an environment. Sunlight is a big one, but there's also LED lights and like lights from my computer screen and lights from a lamp and fluorescent light bulbs. What light is the best light to use in the morning? And the answer for that is sunlight because in most of the artificial lights we've created, there's just not enough lux for it to activate something in your body, right? So worst case scenario, there's no sun in your environment because it's early in the morning, you live in like Scandinavia or something, then you can turn on all the lights in your house and they'll do something, but it's really like a hundred times less effective than just going outside for five minutes and getting sunlight in your eyes. Um, windows are not a great way to do this because windows block about 50, 50 times. Windows make the effect of the sunlight 50 times less. So you basically have to st stand by the window getting the sunlight in for 50 times longer than you were if you just stood outside and got the sunlight in instead. And same thing with sunglasses, they make it like a hundred times worse. So I would recommend just going outside and just getting the sunlight in. No sunglasses, no window, no artificial lights, just sunlight. So the guidelines that I use for this is that if it's a bright, sunny day, the sun is shining in my face, five minutes is plenty for you to feel awake and say, okay, your body knows it's morning time. If it's a cloudy day, you might think, okay, well, there's no sun outside today. Well, the fact that you can see things around you means that there is sun outside. It's just that you need to stand outside for longer to get the effect of the sunlight. So on a cloudy day, I stand outside for 10 minutes and I get more sunlight in so that I feel more awake. If it's rainy or overcast, about 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how bad it is. Like if it's a drizzle, like 10, 15 minutes is fine. If it's like pouring down, probably want to stay out there for like 30 minutes to get enough sunlight. And again, we said there's different amounts of sunlight at different times of the day. So really, if you can get it very close to the time that the sun rises, like within a few hours of that, as soon as you wake up in the morning, going outside will really benefit you. Um, again, another thing you could do is get some light in the evening because it will tell your body it's starting to get evening time and afternoon. Just the more inputs you can give your body, the more grounded your circadian rhythm is aligned with the clock of the world, right? So if you're never getting sunlight in, make sure your body is somewhat adjusted to the 24 hour cycle, but in reality, it's gonna get confused and it's gonna be lost because it's not able to adjust it to like without the inputs and cues, right? Um, to help illustrate this point a little bit more, when there was an experiment done where someone was put in a cave for a period of time, just as an experiment to see how his body would, would react, his hormones got all messed up in the fact that like after some time he was falling asleep and waking up at different times that he normally would during the day um obviously he didn't have a clock or anything with him but he kind of like logged and i'm like he would communicate back with people out on the top about times he was sleeping times he was awake and it found out that his wake up and sleep times started getting messed up and adjusted differently um the amount of the times he felt hunger were getting different because his circadian rhythm wasn't able to get any inputs or cues into his body to tell him what time of day it is and what, how we should feel. Which is why it's so essential for us to get sunlight in our eyes to tell our body, okay, this is the time of day that we're in because that will make sure that the times we feel hungry are stay the same and most importantly, the time we feel awake and asleep also stay the same. A quick problem I wanna discuss is that we live in darkness because sure, we get outside a couple times a day, but most people don't even leave their house. I encourage you to think of an employee who is working in the city who uses a subway directly from his residence to his workspace and he just goes back and forth through there and he's basically never outside. He doesn't get any sunlight. So 
I know that we like to say that, okay, we get outside, I get a few amounts, like, sure, I go outside and I'll go on walks and runs and things like that outside. But at the same time, the amount of time we spent indoors has just never been as high as it is today. And which is why I really encourage people to go outside and get more sunlight in because it really helps not only our circadian rhythm align with times of the day, but just in general for your health and overall. And another thing I want to talk about is that while we are living in darkness, we're also drowning in light. And this is going into like, when you're going to bed at night, when we need when we need to feel awake in the morning and we want our circadian rhythm to know it's morning time, we need a lot of sunlight communicated to our eyes to know that that is the time of day is. But at nighttime, even a little bit of light, even from an artificial light, can mess up our whole circadian rhythm. And this is a challenge because in the last 50 to 100 years, with the advent of new technologies, there's lights everywhere, sleep quality has drastically decreased because when I'm working on my computer at 10 at night, getting all this artificial light in my eyes, when in reality, like hundreds of years ago, there was no source of light besides the sun, that became a challenge because now our body always thinks it's daytime, our body's getting so much sunlight inside of us that it thinks that, okay, I should be feeling awake all the time, which is why like, if I'm working on my computer late at night, there's lights from my fluorescent light bulb, I'm using my phone before I go to bed, then I try to go to bed, your body's not gonna feel as tired because it's gonna be challenging to enter that sleep state when your body still thinks that it's time for us to be awake, given the amount of light we're feeding your body. So the tool that I can help you with today is that late at night, try to avoid light as much as possible, right? So obviously it's kind of hard to carry out our day-to-day -day activities without light. So I encourage you to minimize it to the best of your ability. Like if you want to turn your fluorescent light bulbs off and like have just like dim lighting, maybe like I have these LED lights in my room. I like to use those. I feel like that helps me a little better. Um, try to avoid like most computers and screens and like that hour or two before your bedtime. That will help a lot. Um, all right. One thing I do as well, this is a little bit more extreme. Um, so you don't have to pick this up if you don't want to, but if I'm in my room with lit dim lighting with no computers and I have to get something from outside of my room, sometimes I'll throw on sunglasses cause they really block the effect of light. But that's just an idea in case you're interested in that. Okay. Section three is about temperature, right? So by the way, we're going to be going through like many different variables that we can adjust today. So we've talked about the foundation of sleep. What is sleep? We've talked about how light impacts our sleep, both in a good way and a bad way, how it can make our circadian rhythm aligned with the, the um, clock of the world. And now the third variable that we're going to talk about is temperature. So temperature is a huge factor in how we feel. Um, in terms of whether we feel awake or asleep. And the main thing you want to take away is that higher body temperature makes you feel more awake and lower body temperature makes you feel more tired. And indeed, when you're going to bed at night, for you to be able to sleep, your body needs to drop by one to three degrees Fahrenheit. And if you can't drop in temperature, you won't be able to sleep. That's why it's easier for you to fall asleep in a very, very cold room than a very, very hot room. Now, if you're want to get really good quality sleep there's a few tools i can give you um and one thing is just to have a cool sleep environment right so if you want to open the window if you want to turn on a fan put on the ac make your environment cold like i would suggest honestly if it's a, it's a hot summer day like anywhere between 65 to 70 degrees is usually fine for me um and it doesn't mean you have to like freeze yourself right because if you just were to like sit there in your underwear on bed with no blanket and just pour cold air on you I, I think your body temperature will probably go up to compensate for all the cold that you're pouring on you. So I would say try the best to keep the environment cool, not like super ice cold, but cool environment. Have a blanket on top of you so that you still kind of stay warm and your body temperature is regulated. And even if you cover yourself with lots of blankets, um, that's still fine because your hands and feet are kind of skin portals that regulate the temperature in your body. What that basically means is even if I'm covered in a blanket, but I stick my hand out from underneath the sheets, it's going to still control my body temperature by making me... Um, Basically, like if the hand is getting warmer, like that will change the temperature of my body overall. And a second tool that you can use are cold and hot showers. So when we put water on our body, it will be able to change our body temperature because um, it, basically if you put cold water on our body, our body will want to compensate for that by increasing your body temperature, right? So if I take a cold shower in the morning for 30 to 120 seconds itself, it will do. 
you will feel more awake from that in the hours that follow in addition to all the other health benefits of the cold shower so in the morning i really suggest taking the cold shower because the cold water on your skin will increase your body temperature which means that the opposite is true in the evening if you take cold shower in the evening you'll probably like not improve your sleep but probably impact your sleep in a negative way but warm shower will help you to sleep better because it will lower your body temperature in the hours that follow making it an easier transition for you to sleep right so if i'm doing my night routine I've shut all the lights in my house. I just took my warm shower. It's putting me in, like lowering my body temperature. And I walk into my cool sleep environment. I'm gonna get pretty good sleep. So yeah, that's temperature. Section four, nutrition. Now this is a quick one, um, but really when I talk about nutrition, it's a lot of things that you eat are important. So obviously you don't wanna be eating a lot of shit food that your body is struggling to digest. Um, Cause that would obviously make sleep quality worse. But more importantly is the timing of your meals, right? If you're eating too late in the day, it will imp impact your sleep quality um, because your body like needs energy to digest that food. And if it's all like, if all your energy is gone into digesting your food, it's gonna be struggling for, it'll be a struggle for you to sleep. And I see this pattern a lot in myself. Like when I eat dinners late, I, I know I always find more trouble to fall asleep later in that day. Um, so again, um, going back to your circadian rhythm, Consistent meal times are also good because if you're eating at the same time every single day, then your circadian rhythm can get adjusted to that, which will also help improve your sleep quality. Um, going back to like wakefulness, if you eat like a big meal before you're about to like get work done, you might notice that you're not as productive in your work, right? So if you, less about sleep quality, but more about like feeling tired during the day, Eating a lot of food, high carb, will make you feel bloated and tired. So you want to make sure that like what the timing of your meals and in relation to, like when you're working. Um, I might make a video about this in the future about intermittent fasting for getting productivity, productive work done. But you want to just be careful with the alignment of your meals so that you're not your meals are not messing up your sleep quality. And then fifth, we have movement and exercise, right? So. Again, this kind of goes back to the idea of temperature because when you're moving and you're exercising, it is messing up, uh, sorry, it is, um, when you're moving and you're exercising, it's gonna be changing the temperature of your body as well, right? So when you're exercising, I'm in the lift, lifting heavy weights, it's gonna increase my body temperature. If I'm going on a run, it's gonna increase my body temperature. So most forms of exercise will increase your body temperature, meaning that they will make you feel more awake. So if your goal is to feel awake in the morning, Moving in the morning is good for you to increase your body temperature, not only right there and then, but in the hours that follow, right? So if you wake up in the morning, and even if you just do a little bit of jump rope in the morning, or you wake up in the morning and you go on a light jog, it doesn't have to be anything extreme, like five, 10 minutes here, that will increase your body temperature in the hours that follow. And at the same time, if you exercise late in the evening, when you're trying to get into like a sleep state, it will increase your body temperature for the hours that follow, which will cause you to struggle to sleep that same night. Right, so I've noticed that every time where I work out late for whatever reason, like I work out a few hours later in the evening, it definitely does make it harder for me to sleep. And especially if you're doing like late night workouts right after you're gonna try to sleep, that makes it really difficult as well. Now, for some people, it's different. They like find that it helps them fall asleep better when they work out late at night. I just encourage you to play around with it before you like make a decision about like this is what works for me. Um, and just know that scientifically, it is increasing your body temperature. So. Movement and exercise highly dictates how well you sleep. Now, while it does increase your body temperature, another angle that we can look at movement and exercise is that when you're just moving and exercising throughout the day, you will sleep better during the during the night, right? So obviously, if you're not exercising during the day compared to you are exercising during the day, you're just gonna get better sleep if you are, right? But the important thing is that you wanna make sure you time it correctly so that it's not in a way negating the positive impacts of your sleep. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about are just a recap of like some of the things that are really, really messing up your sleep, All right? So, and one thing I wanna talk about is melatonin, All right? So we hear melatonin, most people immediately think about like the, the su melatonin supplement that you can buy at like a pharmacy, but melatonin is actually, for those of you who don't know, it's a hormone, right? So it's a hormone that makes us feel tired at night. Right? So we have natural levels of melatonin in our body. And then as we discussed before, there's like a timer in our body that makes us feel awake and tired. And a lot of that is regulated by how much melatonin is circulating in our body at that time of day. So 
Taking melatonin is probably the worst thing you can do for your sleep, even though this kind of sell it to you as like, take melatonin to, increase, to improve the quality of your sleep. Melatonin is just pretty bad for your sleep. Now, the reason for that is because, first of all, supplements in general are good for you, but whenever there's like a hormone supplement, I would always be cautious of that because of how, um, what that really is doing to your body, you have to think about that. Because by putting melatonin in your body, you're probably gonna be like making it easier for you to fall asleep right there and then. But in the long term, it's gonna um, make your sleep quality worse, right? Because it might only make you feel tired for like the two or three hours that follow after you take the melatonin. But then in general, you're probably gonna be finding yourself more awake at night, more need, and you, you might think that, okay, now I feel more awake, now I have to take more melatonin. It's like a negative cycle. I just highly recommend not taking melatonin because it's not naturally making your body be able to fall asleep. It's kind of just giving like a short burst of tiredness and it's not really helping you in the long run. I think there are definitely supplements you can use to improve the quality of your sleep. I personally don't take any, so I'm not gonna be discussing them in this video. But if you were to research online, there's plenty and plenty of supplements you can take. And at the end of the video, I'll provide some um, different resources that you can use to learn more about supplements. Melatonin is definitely not one of the ones I would recommend. Second thing that is messing up your sleep is devices late at night. I'm not going to go back into this because we've already talked about it, but just know that if you're using your phone at night, if you're using computers at night, the, the myths are true, it will impact your sleep, right? And I think I didn't mention before is like, okay, if you can't use light at night, what type of light should you use um, for you to carry out your activities, right? So I, I mentioned I use LED lights, which works out for me, but really the only lights that will not impact your sleep quality at all are number one is the um, moonlight. Moonlight does not have any effect. The, the lux from moonlight is so low that it's not going to impact the quality of your sleep. And second is candlelight. Um, obviously, I don't know. I don't expect you to have a candle on your desk unless you really, really want to go extreme with it. Um, for me, I kind of just dim the lights to the best of my ability and the minimum that I need to carry out whatever work that I'm doing. Um, one thing that I've noticed, I've not really read about this online yet. I've not seen anyone talk about this, but I've noticed this for myself just from like times in the, like most of the time when I am at like my boarding school and I'm going to sleep, usually in the two to three hours before my bedtime, I'm not really talking to anyone just cause like that's just how it ended up being with like my routine and, and um, schedule. So when I, I realized that when I did end up talking to people in that period, it kind of messed up the sleep pressure that I was building up for going to bed. So sleep pressure is kind of like this thing that we can think about is like it's building up over time that makes us feel more and more tired throughout the evening. And I felt that whenever I had a conversation with someone, it just immediately spiked my sleep pressure and it kind of just made me feel more awake in the hours that followed. So for me, I know this is true that I don't like to talk to people like the hour or so before my bedtime. And I find that it really, really helps me to improve my sleep. This might be a stretch, it might be like too extreme for you to just not talk to anyone for an hour before your bedtime. But if you have the ability to try it out and test it for yourself and just compare the two to each other, I recommend it because for me, I know for a fact that when I talk to people in the hours before my sleep, it really spikes up my um, my like energy levels and it kind of just negates all the sleep pressure and other things I've been doing to kind of build up myself to get tired at night. Okay, I want to talk about some digital tools that you can use to both assess your sleep and improve your sleep. So the one number one I used is Sleep Cycle app. Um, and one of the things I haven't really talked about in this video is that alarm clocks are also really bad for your, your sleep quality because ideally you want to be waking up naturally, right? Um, that is like a 110 out of 10 scenario where like, if you can just wake up naturally at a time that you want to wake up, that can, can confirm to your body that this is the time that you're naturally waking up because of your circadian rhythm. And alarm clock is just such an unnatural way to wake up that it really like, not only does it like mess up your like your sleep quality rhythm, but it also just gives gives you like PTSD throughout the day. Whenever you hear that sound, it just like hurts your head. It's such an unnatural way to wake up. It makes like waking up in the morning kind of shitty. Like if I wake up from an alarm, I know like the hours that follow just feel like shit. So for me, when I downloaded the sleep cycle app about a year ago, and I've been using it since, I've like not used an alarm clock since then, I find it so much easier to wake up in the morning with this app. So the way this app works is that it uses sounds in your environment to be assessing your sleep quality. So in addition to helping you wake up in the morning, it will give you like stat, it will give you like stats about how well you slept. But really what I use it for is that it kind of, in a 30 minute window you set for it, right? So every morning I have my 30 minute window 
for 6.30 a.m. to 7 a.m., it'll find the time that you're least awake in that window, and then it'll wake you up at that time with like a nice like, soothing sound that's not like some alarm clock banging in your head. And then for me, the sleep cycle app is probably like the best thing I've done because it makes waking up in the morning so much easier for me than having to like listen to like an annoying ass alarm that I just keep hitting snooze on. Um, I recommend the sleep cycle app. It makes waking up in the morning a lot better. Um, some other tools that I don't personally use, but I'm interested in using that I've heard so much about online that I felt like I, if I'm making a video about sleep, I kind of have to mention these things. Number one is a sleep mattress. This is a mattress that controls the temperature of your sleep. Um, throughout the night so that it helps you to fall into a sleep state and then wake up by changing the temperature of your blanket and your mattress. And we talked about before like how important temperature is dictating your sleep. Eight sleep basically masters that skill and helps you to control the temperature of your bed. Um, I, I'm interested in buying this soon, so if I do end up buying it, I'll make another video about how it's worked for me. But in general, I think this would be a cool tool if you're looking for something like that to help really go and make an investment on the extreme side of things and improve your sleep. Um, and the second tool is more for just assessing your sleep quality. There are many like different sleep bands and like rings you can buy that you can put on your hand. Um, a few that I've heard about are, like the Whoop band and the Aura band. You can wear them and then it'll basically assess your sleep quality better than the Sleep Cycle app because the Sleep Cycle app only uses sounds in the environment. This one can actually use like your heart heartbeat and vibrations to assess how well you're sleeping. Um, I will say if you buy Sleep Cycle, don't buy the premium because the premium is kind of kind of pointless. There's not many features in that. But yeah, those are the three tools I'll give you. Um, you can decide if you want to research those and try this out for yourself. Um, in theory, they should all help be helping you improve your sleep. Okay, um, we have about two sections left. Before we get into like the further resources section, I want to really touch about how do you recover from bad sleep? Because you might add all the tools that I've talked about in this video, like you might be um, taking advantage of the light, you might be taking advantage of the temperature, um, and all the other things we've talked about. But once in a while, you might just have a night where you get really shitty sleep. How do you recover from that? First, first thing you might want to ask yourself is, the first thing you might ask yourself in general is like, do naps help, right? And I found that for most people, it's somewhere like in the middle where some people are like, yes, I love naps. I take an hour nap and I feel great afterwards. And the other people like me, and when I take a nap, I just feel like shit for the rest of the day. So. For me, I'm totally against naps for myself because I know that I feel like horrible after a nap. But for some people, like they, they enjoy taking a nap and it helps them out. So for those people, definitely go ahead and take a nap. Just one thing I want to mention is that naps can impact the quality of your sleep if you sleep too late in the day. But I think between 12 and 4, ideally, is a great time for a nap in case you get like bad sleep quality. For me, the best thing that I found for me is that since naps don't really work for me, there's like NSDR, which is called non-sleep deep rest, which is basically a script you can listen to for 20 to 30 minutes at a time, which will help you to feel like you slept for another five or eight hours. So it's it's pretty extreme, but it feels really great. Great. So it basically does body scans for you and helps you put you into like a very deep relaxation, and that helps you to like feel more awake, especially if you feel tired during the day. So oftentimes, if it's evening time and I feel tired, like in the afternoon. I might do one of those between 12 and 4 p.m. just so I can feel more awake in the second half of my day. Um, with the naps, like you can play around with it to see like what works for you. But in general, a guideline I'll set is probably you don't want to exceed an hour for your naps. At that point, you're sleeping so much during the day that it would impact the amount you can sleep during the night. But definitely about an hour of napping or something like that, definitely really good for you. So one thing that people notice is that their wakefulness just naturally drops in the afternoon. Like if... Uh, like if you can think of like a chart of like how awake you feel, right? In the morning you'll feel very awake and it's like slowly going down during the day. And then right afternoon it drops like this. You feel like incredibly tired after you eat lunch and it usually goes back up and then it kind of like winds down by eight, nine, ten before you go to bed. So naturally this um, pattern of our sleep is like universal among most of other humans. And one of the reasons why is most likely because of evolution we have like evidence to suggest that hunter gatherers used to follow a type of sleep called biphasic sleep where they would sleep both at um nighttime and in the afternoon so they would basically take a short nap between 12 and 4 p.m in addition to the seven to eight hours of sleep they had the night before right so i definitely think that following like the way that we used to do it back in the day is really good for us as well um since our wakefulness just naturally drops in the afternoon Definitely like take some time, 12 to 4, if you really do feel tired to take that nap. 
um, for me, like I find if I do take like a quick like NSDR for like 30 minutes in the afternoon, I feel so much better in the second half of the day, I can get even more complete. Um, one more like side side note, this is like maybe not as important for you, but for how our circadian rhythm works, it basically changes over time, right? So there's different periods over time in our life where we're getting different amounts of REM and NREM sleep. Um, REM sleep is just an NREM sleep are basically two types of sleep that our body switches between every night and they're used for different purposes. So the, the amount of REM and NREM sleep we're getting every night and like the amount, the times that we feel tired and awake during the night are changing as we're growing up and we're getting older. So as we mature, this balance keeps changing as our brain is maturing as well. And for a teenager, sleep is absolutely essential, except there's a main problem they face because for them, naturally their circadian rhythm gets shifted back by a couple hours when they transition to their teenage years. This is one of the reasons why most teenagers feel more awake around like 11 or 12 o'clock when most like adults are starting to feel tired and they wanna to go to bed. So the circadian rhythm shifts, so really the ideal time for a teenager to sleep is a little bit later at night and waking up a little later in the morning, except with early school start times, it kind of gets messed up. With parents thinking that they shouldn't be up so late, it gets messed up. I think, I, in my opinion, it's important for teenagers to be able to stay up a little bit later and wake up a little bit later as well, because that's how their circadian rhythm is naturally, um, is at the time of their life. But they're actually getting less sleep than they need, which is affecting how their brain is developing and all the other benefits we talked about at the beginning of this video. So that's pretty much it. I hope that the content in this video has helped you in some way. I know it's quite a long video, about an hour long, and there's many different things that in this video that you can use, try, implement, and see if it works for you. Um, I'm gonna close out with other resources to learn more if you're interested. Um, probably one of the best ones you can use is this book by Matthew Walker called Why We Sleep. Um, this one here just breaks down like all the science. Like we've kind of gone into some of the science of sleep, but in a lot, a lot more detail, he'll go through that. Um, I think kind of it's important to understand like how we really sleep in the first place because that will help us to understand like why we're doing this in the first place and make it like, more important in our head for us to be getting the like, good quality sleep. And in addition to that, he has plenty of tools in here, um, including the ones that I've discussed today that have helped me um, for you to go check out. Um, I also recommend checking out like Huberman podcasts. Um, Andrew Huberman is a um, neurologist on YouTube who basically goes through and he has three or four different full length podcasts about improving your sleep and the science of sleep. So definitely you can go there. That's where I learned a lot of the things I've talked about in today's video. Um, there's just all these resources that are available to improve your sleep and I'm sure there's more online, but I don't want to waste all your time and tell you to and give you all hundred resources that I've seen. I think if you really want to improve your sleep, just going to those two would probably help you the most. Um, I mean, you can always like this, I think these two resources, in addition to like what I've talked to today, will give you like 95% of the knowledge you really need. And then if you were to go watch more and more, it'll probably like give you like smaller benefits here and there. But there's just so much in those two resources that I'd recommend starting there. All right, thank you everyone for watching. I hope this guide has been a help to you and then stay on the lookout for more of these videos.